very well. I'm not very good, but I'll give you two opportunities to. Uh, uh, my brother-in-law said I shouldn't recognize you, but you know, because of some of them, I'm recognizing you. Ask two questions, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee. My first question has to do with street lighting. Street lighting. Street lighting promotes security and improves the quality of life for our people. It is for this reason that the public lighting levy was imposed on all domestic consumers of electricity in this country. You recall that in August 2020, you appear before this August House to answer a question in respect of how much you have realized in terms of money from the public lighting levy for 2018 and 2019. You indicated before the House that for the two years you realize 273 million Ghana cities. And out of that amount, 84 million Ghana cities was released to you. And at the time you were speaking to the House, you had expended 60 million, 64 million out of that. This gives us an indication that on annual basis, that levy is able to rake in not less than 137 million Ghana cities. This, I believe, is enough to provide efficient street lighting system for the good people of this country. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Why is it that Ghanaians have paid so much for street lighting, yet we still have problems with street lighting in our country? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think you, you are right that the street, light, street lighting is very key for uh, the country. Yes, Mr. Chairman, as a ministry, we began an aggressive uh, process to introduce street lights to regional capitals and some selected municipal uh, capitals across this country. And the, the facts are there for uh, everybody uh, to see. Unfortunately, the amount that you talked about, about 100 million you know, annually, uh, can provide street lights to maybe just about two or three uh, municipal you know, uh, uh, districts. So there is a need for more capital injection you know, to be able to undertake this uh, activity efficiently and effectively. Not all the 100% of the street line levy comes to the ministry. As you rightly put it, in 2020, about 84 was sent to the, uh, to the ministry. So I think going forward, we would, my advice I will give to the new sector minister uh, coming in is to lobby for more of the proportions of the levy to come to the ministry so that they can embark on more aggressive street life for other communities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable Minister, let's be clear. The street that left, it is to pay for what? The energy used or the bulbs provided? What is it to pay for? To pay for? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's for two, two uh, both directions, both the uh, energy use and then for the service. The levy actually is placed on every consumer's bill. So if you take your, your bill today, you see a percentage that you pay for the, the street light. Most of the questions that arise in some communities, just as the honor member has put it clear, is that some communities are paying for street lights. Meanwhile, they are not enjoying the, the benefit of, of the street light. And that is why the ministry came out with a policy to make sure that extension of street light cuts across districts, regional capitals. You've seen that we started that in most of the regional capitals and then move down to some of the district uh, level. It's a process, and the incoming minister, of course, uh, I'm going to speak to him to make sure that this process is completed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, my second question. 
In paragraph 463 of the 2017 budget, it is indicated that the government of the MPP under the leadership of Nana Adunako Kufado took over this country when electricity coverage was at 83.24%. And when we come to the 2020 budget, at paragraph 818, it is provided that electricity coverage was at 84.89%. 84.98%, indicating that in the last four years, electricity coverage was increased by 1.74%. Can you explain to the committee what has accounted for this tortoise-like pace in the extension of electricity to Ghanaians in the last four years? Thank you. It is a fact that between 2008 and 2016 have been uh, a sequential jump in the electricity uh, access into the country. This is as a result of some of the 10 key projects that migrated from the year 2000, 2004 into uh, 2020 because a lot of the 10 key projects were already in existence and they were ongoing. As I speak uh, during the past four years, most of those 10 key projects have come to a halt. And Mr. Chairman, this House will admit that we brought in a number of 10 key projects that have been approved by this House. The, uh, at least I can remember about three or four of them that were brought to this House for approval. It is expected that when those 10 key projects go into operation, we may be able to increase the access rate. So yes, of course, it's on record that within the past four years, we've not been able to increase the penetration you know, as quickly as possible because the tanking projects, most of them had halted in terms of their duration. This new one that we brought to the House uh, for approval, when the commencement began, we should be able to increase the percentage to about 90 percent, which we call a complete access. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, my last question. No, honorary, let me do a chairman. We are talking about last. Chairman, just one more. No, no, but... Chama, I just you use the word halted. Ten key project. If it's completed, it's completed. If it's executed to fullest, let us know. When you say halted, because we normally will approve some amount of money with number of communities to be covered. Can you clarify what you the statement you just made? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, a number of them were completed. I use the word halted because of the COVID uh uh, period where work, you know, uh, was very slow in some of the areas, especially in some part of Volta region and northern region. Uh, most of the contractors could not move to sites because of the COVID. So should we expect the contractors to go back to site and when to get those rural communities benefit from yes. the expansion yes. program? Yes, Mr. Chairman, as I speak now, there's mobilization for most of them to get back to sites. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the last opportunity. Honorable nominee, in 2014, in your capacity as the Senior Research Fellow of the African Center for Energy Policy, you spoke extensively against flaring of gas, indicated that it will have some negative effects on the economy if that is not checked immediately. You articulated measures that need to be put in place to ensure that gas produced is put into productive use in our country. Fortunately, you assumed office and you became the Minister of Energy for our country. We are told that by World Bank that in 2017, gas fled in Ghana alone valued at 20 billion U.S. dollars, and subsequently we have been flaring gas. Can we share with the committee the value, the monetary value of gas flared in the last four years and the measures we put in place to bring this to an end in our country? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. 
Yes, of course, clearing of gas has its own environmental externalities, which every government will try to internalize. I did spoke against the flaring of gas because of the impact. Mr. Chairman, 2017, I was not a sector minister, but thereafter, yes, of course, I must agree that some volume of gas has been flared. The minimum, the minimum volume of gas that we allowed to be flared was because of technical reason. Talo, our offshore operators, came to us to let us understand that if we do not allow the gas to be consumed, then the only option for them is to flare it to enable the reservoir to maintain its pressure and for speedy extraction of the, the resources. Because at that point, they were talking about whether we consider the oil or we consider the gas to be flared. Because the gas at that time, again, within the uh, Western Corridor was stranded and we do not therefore have uh, a demand for it because facilities to consume the gas as early as that time were not available. So after movement of the car power and creating other necessary demands in terms of, you know, uh, uh, other facilities that are taking the gas, for instance, those ceramic factories that we see in Chakra, they taking the gas, we have minimized largely uh, on the flaring uh, of the gas. It was flared basically because of the need to maintain the reservoir pressure to enable us to extract the oil. Mr. Chairman, I'm not in a position to quantify the, 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 the cost and if this house of course, will allow, if I'm granted the, the, the permission, uh, I would come back to the house and provide the actual cost of gas that was fled during the period. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to a different ministry. No, that's why we should be looking forward rather than we're spending so much time for matters behind us. Yes, Honorable Muntaka. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chairman, the nominee started as Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, right? Yes, Mr. Chairman. And under you was the Mineral Development Fund? Yes, Mr. Chairman. What is the procedure for disbursement of the Mineral Development Fund? Mr. Chairman, the Mineral Development Fund is uh, expected to be distributed uh, through some formula and to be presided over by the, the board. Uh, the board is responsible, you know, as the authorizing body for uh, uh, distributing the Mineral Development Fund. The formula for distribution is also as enshrined in the law of the Mineral Development Act. Why did you disperse the Mineral Development Fund in 2017 without the board? Why did you disperse that fund without the board in 2017? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, in the absence of the board, the sector minister has an oversight responsibility. And constituting the board, Mr. Chairman, at that time took some months. Uh, there was urgent need for the, the fund to undertake some critical activities. Uh, that are very essential to the sustainability uh, of the fund. It was on that basis that I authorized the disbursement of the fund without the approval from the board because there was no board uh, in position at that time, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to refer the nominee to the Mineral Development Act, Act 912. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Section 5, application of the fund. No, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, sorry, I was right. Section 5. For the purpose of achieving the object of the fund, monies from the fund shall be applied to the relevant activities that the board may determine. Mr. Speaker, in this act, there's no way that it's said that in the absence of the board, 
the minister should disperse the fund. But if you could guide me, being the sector minister then, which section of this act enables him to disperse the fund without a board? Mr. Chairman, what I did is that as a sector minister, I was responsible for the, those agencies with an oversight responsibility. At the time I authorized the disbursement, the board was not in existence. And there was an urgent need for sustainability of the fund to go on with its operational activities. The disbursement of the fund is in accordance with the formula. So irrespective of a minister or a board, the formula will be followed. What I did was just to ask them to go according to the formula and disperse it accordingly. The fund was not disbursed ask outside the formula. The them refers to who? He said what you did was to ask them to go in accordance with the formula. Who is ask them? The board. The, sorry, was to ask the mineral development uh, operational uh, activity, which is the chief executive. The management. The management, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, I refer him to section 6, sorry, 7, functions of the board. The board is responsible for the management of the fund and for the purpose, and, and for that purpose shall ensure the proper and effective performance of the functions of the fund. Mr. Chairman, I still ask him. Which section of this act gave you the authority to disperse without the board? Mr. Chairman, this state that in absence of the board, every ministry has its agencies. In absence of board, the minister responsible take that oversight responsibility. And what is interesting about this particular fund is that the funds are not distributed by unilateral uh, decisions. There is a particular laid down formula, 2%, 3%, 16%. So what I did was to authorize them to comply with the formula for distribution because there was an urgent need for operation of the board and we couldn't have operation of the fund and we couldn't have wait for the board to come into an existence. If we had wait to do that, the, the, the fund would not operate. And it was on that means that we authorized the, the, the fund management to go ahead to disperse you know, the fund to the various uh, uh, agencies are garage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, on this lastly, is he of the view that once ministers play oversight in the act of a board, the minister acts on behalf of the board or can take actions that boards are supposed to take? Is that what you are implying? Mr. Chairman, that's exactly what I intend to say. Mr. Chairman, he was at the land ministry and earlier to a question about illegal mining and the excavators that were purported to have gotten missing. You said that you are not aware that any of the excavators were missing. Is that what the impression that I got? At the time I was the last minister, there was no missing excavator when I was the last minister. When you seized them, where did you place them? Where were they placed after your seizure? When you seized them, where did you place them? Mr. Chairman, I earlier stated that I did not seize any excavator. I asked for withdrawal of excavators from mining sites. And the military or the team, the Operation Vanguard, did so, right? Mr. Chairman, I was not the chairman of that committee. And so the details will be with the chairman of the Interministerial Committee, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, so when you ask that those excavators be withdrawn from the field, you didn't follow up where they were withdrawing them to? Mr. Chairman, at this stage to the Honorable House that at the time I asked for withdrawal of excavators and extended it by an additional 30 days, about 500 excavators were withdrawn from the mining site and taken out of the mining environment. What happened there after was the seizure which went through other processes. Because as a minister, you cannot seize excavators. Excavators from mining sites can only be seized with a regulatory framework derived from the AG's department. And that is the process 
that process, I did not undertake process. What I did was to act for the withdrawal of excavators from my site. So when those excavators were withdrawn, did you follow up to see that the regulatory framework that you have mentioned was followed through? Chairman, uh, I left the Ministry of Lands. Uh, Honorable, when you say withdraw them, was that an action from your ministry or the, those who took them to the site were to take them back? I asked those who sent the excavators to the mining site to take them back. That was what I meant, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to find out from him if you'll be surprised if those Owners tell me to today and tell you that they never received back their excavators. Will you be surprised? Uh, well, of course, that might be after I left the ministry, so uh, I will not be surprised if it, it happened. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Mr. Chairman, you were, you were, you have even currently the present representative at the Ministry of Energy, right? The present representative at the Ministry of Energy. I'm saying currently you are. Yes, yes, Mr. Chairman. And there's been a, a lot of talk about this aluminium integrated program from the government. They talk about the aluminium integrated program that involves Valco mining of uh, iron ore or aluminium and all the others. Yes, Mr. As a Minister for Energy, you know that you cannot do this without sufficient power. Yes, Mr. Chairman. And you know that it is not just any power, you need cheap power. Yes, Mr. Chairman. What have you done in the past two years that I've been at the Ministry to help generate cheap power that will, be in, that will enable this aluminium integrated program to take off? Mr. Park, Mr. Chairman, uh, discussions have been held at various levels to make sure that available and cheaper power is made available to the corporation, which is the Gidjak Corporation, to make sure that they can undertake the refining of the, the product. Uh, what we were discussing at that time was to dedicate uh, hydro, because to be able to do such projects uh, with some level of return on investment, we should be looking at a power of, say, two cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, today, in Ghana, it's difficult to, to get that. So the school of thought was to dedicate uh, Volta Lake, uh, our Volta Dam, Akosumbo, which is, of course, hydro. Uh, that will be dedicated solely for the industry. There was also another school of thought where the proposal from some companies from Japan were here to say that they are prepared to generate, you know, I think about 800 megawatts but the first 300 megawatts or 400 megawatts will trade at a value of, say, two cents per kilowatt hour, and the rest will trade apart with the, uh, the current price in the system. But because of our capacity uh, issues that we have, it was very difficult to take in such a proposal. And so as at the time I was leaving the ministry, my discussion that I had with the team was to see how we can dedicate hydro for this particular industry, because hydro today we may have recovered the cost of investment over our Kosovo Dam, apart from the operational charges, and thereby we can trade hydro for the industry at a very low rate. Mr. Chairman, if you were suggesting we isolating hydro for those purposes, you know the implication on the general uh, tariffs, right? Yes, of course, the uh, implication on the general tariff, uh, I know, uh, we should expect a slight movement up of the tariff. Uh, already, you know, the tariff in the sub-region, our tariff is, is quite high, but the level of tariff is as a result of some of the inefficiencies that I've talked about. If, as a country, we are able to reduce the distribution losses, you know, from a current 25, 26% down to even about 5%, it means we are putting, injecting an additional 20% into the system, which can also come down to work, you know, lower the, the, the tariff. So we need to do some internal arrangements within the set up of the power uh, agencies to reduce the tariff, then of course we can migrate uh, hydro to, to the sector. That may have some level of impact on the consumer, but that may not be much. Mr. Chairman, what is also interesting is that in most developed countries, we realize that the tariff for industries are far cheaper than the tariff 
for, 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 for consumers, but in Ghana is the reverse. And if you want as a country to industrialize, then we must begin to look at giving the industry some form of you know, relief in terms of the tariff they enjoy so that they can grow the industries within the shortest possible time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this idea that he's talking about, yes, for industry it should be cheaper than for consumption. What prevents you from implementing it once you are at the ministry? Mr. Chairman, it's a very difficult policy issue. Uh, we, we began discussions, and if you uh, recollect the 30% reductions in tariff, uh, the year 2017 was migrating towards that direction. Uh, I will keep up with this discussion with the new uh, uh, minister that is coming to take over from me and see how we can progress to address uh, the problem for industry to enjoy a reliable tariff. You know, uh, Valco has been operating two port lines for a very long period of time. Yes, Mr. Chairman. When you were there as minister, what have you been able to do to help them to be able to fully operate? Mr. Chairman, the problem of uh, Valco, uh, it's, it's something as a country that we all need to, to look at. Uh, cheaper uh, power for uh, Valco at the expense of consumers, or consumers in terms uh, of power enjoying cheaper than what we will give uh, uh, Valco. That issue has not uh, been addressed completely. And so when I was a minister, of course, we uh, tried to put in measures. You will recollect that even before the start operation of the two port, there were some difficulties. Uh, in terms of the two ports that they currently uh, uh, operating. So when I was a minister, we tried to look into some of these their, uh, power issues. They have huge debt, of course, which would have triggered uh, uh, shutting down their power sources. But this discussion, we've engaged with VRA to make sure that they give them some room to operate and see how they can recover their costs. It is expected that VACO is going to play a very significant role in the president agenda of integrated aluminium industry that we wanted to uh, undertake. When that happens, VACO will become a very uh, productive and profitable uh, institution in the country. Well, even before the uh, program kick starts, even with what they are currently operating, we are not able to get them sufficient power to operate fully. How sure are we that when all the other segments of the integrated program kicks in, we we'll be able to have cheap power for them to run sufficiently. I say, as a country, we need to begin to look at dedicating the hydropower as a source for the industrialization agenda uh, of the aluminium industry. That had not been finalized. If those discussions are finalized, what it means is that we, from beginning, going to subsidize the operation, you know, uh, of, of uh, Valco. Don't forget, Valco is going to work. Uh, in tandem with the other uh, uh, sectors that will be involved in the refining and, and, and production of, of the uh, uh, aluminium industry. The, the raw uh, bauxite, of course, will be coming from the site. That raw bauxite will go through the, some processes. And those processes, together with VACO, they will all come together. So whether you're going to lose at the end of uh, uh, exploration or production of the raw bauxite, or you lose at the end of the refining of the bauxite uh, to alumina or whatever it is. This discussion will have to, you know, play out. But definitely, you may not be able to make it at all the, the, the levels. So you may give and take. And that was the understanding that VACO could come in with a cheaper source of power, and VACO will use that as its bargaining, you know, to match with the, uh, the company that will be into the production of the bauxite. Do you remember the generation capacity of our country as of 2017? The generation capacity in 2017? Yes, Mr. Chairman. How much was it? The available, uh, the installed capacity uh, was about, uh, about 4,000 megawatts. But the available uh, at that time, because of issues of uh, fuel fluctuations, you know, it keeps varying and its availability. But at peak, we were having a peak period sometimes about 2,200 megawatts or 2,100 megawatts. And as of today? 
Today, our peak demand is still in the range of about 2,300 uh, uh, megawatts. Uh, our available installed capacity is about 5,000 megawatts. Which other plants came on board to move us from the around 4,000 to the around 5,000? We have a number of power plants uh, that have been signed in uh, since uh, uh, 2016. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the Ameri, uh, the car power, all those emergency plants that have come on board. Uh, Amandi, for instance, has also just come on board. Uh, uh, Power has come on board. All those, you know, additional generation in all totaling quite close to about 1,800 uh, were additional uh, power plants that came on board. So, will you say we have excess capacity? Do I? Do, will you say we have excess capacity? Yes, of course. Uh, the issue of excess capacity has to do uh, with the availability of the plant when called on by demand uh, uh, as a result uh, of the constraint in demand. And so, yes, of course, we still have excess capacity. Uh, install capacity is far uh, ahead of what I talked about. Yes, so as I speak today, we still have excess capacity. Do we export power to any neighboring country? Mr. Chairman, yes, of course, I'm happy to announce to this house that for the first time uh, in the history of this country, export arrangements are uh, in excess, sometimes about 250 megawatts, uh, 300 megawatts between Ivory Coast, um, uh, Burkina Faso, Benin, and uh, Republic of Togo. Yes, so the export arrangements are ongoing. So why was this noise about we were losing so much money on take or pay? Yeah, because the chairman, export of power, uh, it's not like transporting uh, a cargo of uh, uh, crude oil. Uh, power will have to jump. Unfortunately, uh, most of these countries don't have developed infrastructure as we have in Ghana. So we may export power to the border between Ghana and Burkina Faso. But when it gets to Burkina Faso, there is no demand for it. And these are some of the restrictions. We could increase on our export uh, ability. But because the infrastructure are not developed in the surrounding countries that we have, we are limited by the amount of power that we can export. And that is why the rest uh, comes back to our book, you know, as power being available, but not consumed, and therefore reflect as an excess capacity. So why was it why was there the need for us to extend the contract on some of the IPPs? It was very important to uh, look at the payment patterns on government. The extension of the contract, for instance, the discussion with uh, uh, car power, was to make sure that the gas that was standard, Mr. Chairman, it's on record that we were losing quite close $50 million you know, on a monthly basis because of standard gas in the, in the West that were not consumed by any uh, 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 power plant. When we move the car power from Tema to the West, we have saved that uh, 50 million. If car power is not available to consume that gas, what it means is that that gas is also, again, on take and pay basis. And so whether you consume it or not, you may have to pay until the time that you begin uh, uh, to, 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 to consume it. What we did was to look at the capacity charges and spread it over a time because payment in terms of cash flow on government part was becoming very difficult. So how do we reduce the money that government will have to advance frequently to enable the power plant that depends on the gas also to live longer? The only thing we can do was to make sure we extended this. So car power, for instance, because it's feeding on gas and the gas is available, there is a need to look into how long car power will stay. So negotiation began to make sure that we make car power stay longer to consume the gas. Is it the same reason why AXA was also extended? The AXA discussions, of course, came to cabinet, uh, was approved, discussions are going, and it was the same basis because AXA was converting from heavy fuel, which is very expensive, also to gas. Again, because of the standard gas we have and because of the... Uh, a bi-directional flow that we have. Today, Mr. Chairman, we'll be able to have gas flowing from Takradi uh, to Tema and from Tema to Takradi. So the thinking is that we will have ASCA 
now relying on gas rather than uh, a heavy fuel. Uh, Chairman, you were the Minister of Lands when the Forest Reserve at Kofiman in the Afenia area was give, uh, returned to the, the, the owners. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Wow. What Mr. Stated that? Mr. Chairman, it was a, a petition from the, uh, the landowners at the time. Uh, the land, Mr. Chairman, is not acquired by government. It was earmarked, but not acquired. And the inhabitants have then, you know, uh, uh, taken over the, the site for development project. So what the, the landowners asked for was to uh, rectify the arrangements and then, you know, return their land back to them. That was exactly what we did. The petition was sent to Miras, uh, the last commission, the committee was put uh, forward. The examination was done and therefore was returned back to the owners. Did you get some on the land? <laughs> no, Mr. Chair. Did you buy some of it? No, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in Hohoi, before the election, you assisted the resident to change their meters from prepaid to postpaid meters, right? Some communities, Mr. Chairman. And in those communities, what happened when later the ECG came there to do this connection? Mr. Chairman, uh, the Chinese company was working there and uh, the, the meters were really needed. Uh, because these were houses that were consuming electricity, they don't have meters, and so ECG would not even have the uh, uh, ability to go and collect the rates. So what we do was to speed up the installation of meters in those various communities. Did the ECG workers got beaten? Did they got beaten when they were trying to chase the residents for non-payment of their bills? Not as I know, Mr. Chairman. You didn't know that the ECG in Hawaii had to close down its office because of this assault on their staff? Mr. Chairman, not as I am aware of. And the accusation was that you, you ordered for their beating? Mr. Chairman, that is total false. That may not be true, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in an earlier answer to the bailiff that received some beating, did I hear you say that you only heard of the story three days after? Uh, I heard this. Not that I heard it. I, I read it from uh, Joy. Uh, was it a Joy? One of the social media. I could not remember. Uh, uh, on the WhatsApp, I, I read it on the WhatsApp. Yeah. <laughs> when this happened, it was all over the news. You never heard it until three days after. Precisely, Mr. Chairman. And since you heard it, have you tried to reach out to the bailiff? Mr. Chairman, what I did was to, because my name was mentioned in that incident, that my tax, uh, I did not have any tax, and so I uh, talked to my guys, you know, the security guys who were around me, and they have neither no knowledge of the incident, and, and, and so I could not prove further. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in an answer to an earlier question on the PDS, you said they are some of the information, you said certain materials, evidence that they provided were not genuine and not valid and they were fraudulent. Is that what you said? Precisely, Mr. Chairman. What due diligence did you do before giving the uh, contraction PDS? Mr. Chairman, at the time of the PDS transaction from commencement, I was not a sector minister. When you took over as the sector minister, what did you do to ascertain the, the, the facts? Mr. Chairman, I direct ECG to go ahead with this ongoing due diligence process. And it was this due diligence process that established the fact that the security provided was fraudulently acquired and was uh, not valid. Are you then saying that the minister before you did not do a good job? Honorable, uh, uh, that's not at all, Mr. That, that's not a fair question. Please ask another question. Are you yes, saying sir. that the ministry, the Minister of Energy, did not do its work very well? 
Not at all, Mr. Chairman. It's the same thing. It's not fair to ask him to pass judgment. Mr. Chairman, this is very serious thing for the minister to tell us that the ministry that he supervises did not do its work well to the extent that the security that was provided was fraudulent. Mr. Chairman, this is something that we need to probe in. Honorable Leader, he said that when he came here, he asked them to continue with their due diligence. Is and I was said? asking whether the ministry is then saying that the ministry did not do due diligence before awarding the contract. Mr. Chairman, the due diligence process is not an event. It's an ongoing process. And so the ministry could go ahead and give the contract subject to conclusion or evidence that the security granted was valid. And this was exactly what was happening. So ECG was undertaking a due diligence process to establish the validity of the security that was provided by the PDS uh, company. How long has the ministry been engaging in this attempt to engage PDS before the actual contract was signed? How long did, did it take the ministry? Mr. The, the asset was handed over, I think it's in March uh, 20, 2019. In March, the asset was handed over. Uh, before the handing over of the asset, the condition precedent was the fulfillment of a guarantee that merits acceptance by the ECG. So ECG is in process. The guarantee has been provided to ECG. But ECG could not just hold the guarantee and accept it in total faith. What they did further was to prove further to establish whether the guarantee provided was really valid and whether it conforms to the specification as, you know, put in the lease and bulk purchase agreement which they signed between the two companies. It mm -hmm. was in, through that process that ECG realized that no, the guarantee is not a valid guarantee and it was acquired fraudulently. So Did the ministry have a transaction advisor for that process, for that project? Not as I know of, Mr. Mr. Chairman. No, but you've been there for the past two years. No, I, I, do not, I don't have a transaction advisor when I was the minister. So the minister was doing this on his own? Mr. Chairman, it's also important to note that this transaction is a transaction between government company, ECG, and PDS. The two were in this relationship. The ministry provides an oversight responsibility. So the ministry itself was not in direct contract with the, 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 the agencies. But as I was a minister, the time I was a minister, I do not have any transaction advisor. Mr. Chairman, when he says the ministry didn't really, they were only providing a uh, supervisory role, it was the ministry that brought this agreement to this house. Do you know, remember that? Yes, Mr. Chairman. And the ministry, in bringing the document to the house, has not ascertained for itself, convinced itself, that it was carrying a legitimate transaction that it was very sure of. That's why, before bringing it to Parliament? At a point, the ministry brought a document to Parliament. They considered the transaction as being valid but subject to fulfillment of a critical condition precedent, which was not fulfilled at the end. Chairman, with your leave, I have a follow-up. Yes. So, Honorable Minister, um, in your answer to the critical question raised about the security, you gave an impression that upon signing, ECG had a duty to do an enhanced due diligence. Yes, Mr. Chair. And it was as a result of this enhanced due diligence, you insisted it be done, that resulted in this matter of uh, fraudulent. Precisely so. So you will say that your initiative saved the Ghanaian taxpayer. Correct. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I just want to find out whether when this was noticed, there was official communication of this to PDS. Yes, ECG has communicated to PDS and a number of meetings have been held 
Uh, I've attended a couple of those meetings myself as the sector minister there. So yes, that has been done. And what answer did they provide to your notice of their fraudulent, uh, what you call the security? Initial discussion, PDS insisted that there was a valid uh, fulfillment of the condition precedent, which is a subject matter of the security. They did indicate that it was valid, and they insisted on that. Mr. Chairman, I want to find out from the nominee whether Dumso is back. Dumso, Mr. Chairman, is not back. The prolonged era of intermittent power supply, I think, is still of the past. So what is accounting for the recent intermittent of... Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, I did state that currently there's uh, a process of replacement of obsolete equipment. Uh, the President has injected, through, through his direct, di directive, injected about $100 million through ECG to replace some of those equipment. So that is uh, ongoing now. Uh, in those areas that these activities are happening, of course, you expect that uh, there will be some interruption. What I expect the ECG to do is to inform those communities, uh, which, of course, I had a discussion, I met the ECG, MD today and asking that they should give prior notice to those areas that work as going on and I think they will continue to do that. But in the era in which we are now, I can assure this house that the lights will be on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in an earlier answer about the unfortunate incidents in the Krobo uh, area where they had a fracas with the ECG staff that led to some shootings and death, you promised the United Krobo Foundation that you are going to deal with this matter, right? Yes. But in an earlier answer to a question, you said the police were rather handling it. Mr. Chairman, we have not been able to deal with it. I put the committee together. Uh, the committee comments its work. Uh, but at the same time, the matter was lodged with the police. And I think somehow along the line, the committee uh, uh, slow down on its uh, operation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would take this matter up seriously and maybe advise my uh, new uh, coming minister to, to take it up and make sure that the committee completes this work. Uh, I want to use this opportunity to uh, maybe say uh, uh, to my good friends in the Krobo land that the delay in this report, of course, uh, I, I'm responsible, but I can assure them that the next minister, uh, with the support from our outfit, we will make sure that we resolve the issue for them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, you remember they told you that they were waiting for the outcome before they start paying fully their bills? Mr. Chairman. So you know currently they are not paying fully their bills? Yes, Mr. Chairman. And you know that that is likely to create another problem into the future? Precisely so, Mr. Chairman. So that is why you must do well to get this problem over maybe probably before you leave. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll do so. So that's an assurance that you try to work at it before you leave. Mr. Chairman, I'll do my best. Mr. Chairman, the railway lines, the status of the uh, Tapa to Pristia lines, what briefing did you get on that? The Takra Deep uh, Port to Kumasi uh, the progress on the second D Kodu Chrome uh, reconstructed and I'm talking about Takwa Pristia. Takwa Pristia. That is on the western line. That is the existing line through uh, Usuta to Takrade Awasu, which is a distance of about 64 uh, kilometers. Mr. Chairman, this line, uh, the briefing has been given 
is that uh, it's, it's one of the lines which is best for uh, BOT development process. And plans are far advanced to uh, subject this line to uh, development. Uh, research has been done on, on it in terms of the feasibility studies. And a number of uh, proposals has also been received uh, towards the, uh, uh, this line. The intention was to move that whole section down up to, to Kumasi, which is of, of very key because of the exploitation of the mineral resources at Ninahini uh, uh, and uh, Opomaso along the route. And that line, of course, is going to be one of our mineral lines uh, when it's uh, completed. So uh, there's a lot of progress on the line. I did state earlier on about uh, the tremendous work that has been done by my predecessor. And I think getting to office, if the house give me the note, I will make sure that we speed up other works on that line. Well, this is something that during the, the reign of President Kufour, the Takwa Gophers and then Golden Star were to fix those two companies had then promised to fix that rail line. But unfortunately, the gold star has changed hands. And now they are using a bridge around Bogoso. That, is, that has not been even maintained since the 60s. And the danger is that if this bridge also goes off, that will mean the whole of that enclave is likely to suffer heavily. So it is my hope that when you get the opportunity, you will pay attention to this part of the... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yes, Chairman, lastly, the land around Afenia stretch on the Akosombo, Tema Akosombo, Tema Akosombo line. And, I mean, even though they tried to bring the position down, it's too late. There's evidence that, yes, that land was, show government shown interest, as it always does, but has not paid compensation to the original owners, and therefore they went ahead to, to lease it to individuals that have built their homes. And because of the construction of the rail line, uh, a number of communities under Afenia East, Afenia Zongo, and Afenia Ablekuma had their homes and properties uh, demolished and no compensation had, had been paid them when they have, I mean, rightfully acquired their uh, lease through the original owners that have not been paid compensation. Minister, I know you are not there yet. Will you take interest in this to be able to get fair hearing from these residents and probably assist them to get compensated? I will do so if this house gives me the note, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I have no questions for you. Yes, I have majority, minority leader. Mr. Chairman, let me thank you very much. And just to take him back to where the Honorable Muntaka left, Earlier, in an answer to a question by the Honorable Ablaqua on PDS, you seem to be very proud that uh, it was terminated on the basis of a fraudulent guarantee. And Chairman, I'm just referring to a statement which was issued by the Millennium Challenge Corporation of the United States of America and a reads, statement regarding termination of the private sector concession by the government of Ghana. And Chairman, the words I will emphasize is instructive. Washington, D.C., October 23, 2019. In response to the government of Ghana's disappointing decision, disappointing decision to terminate the concession agreement between the electricity company of Ghana ECG to private operator Power Distribution Services Ghana Limited PDS. And then the statement goes further to say 190 million funds granted to Ghana for the 20 year concession from ECG to PDS no longer available. Is that a proud thing that uh, apart from this monumental loss of 190 million US dollars, 
you always must appreciate you also must appreciate the fact that this was the first time ever the country had moved strategically to allow for private sector participation in the distribution of electricity which is also significant now you have repeatedly said that you wrote to pds can you provide a copy of the letter which was written to pds either by you as minister for energy or ecg to prompt them on the uh, problem associated with the guarantee they did thank you chair Mr. chairman i will provide a letter from ecg to uh, thank you chairman and then also in response to an earlier question you said the leak the debt is 1.5 billion u.s dollars has the legacy debt been cleared totally the legacy debt which was in the region of 2 billion u.s dollars as i heard president nana akufuado announced on a foreign trip to canada is this 1.5 to be added to the 2 billion or the 2 billion have been cleared and this is new additional debt within the energy sector thank you the the debt as it stands now is 1.5 and that means that it has been brought down from the 2.7 level to the current uh, 1.5 uh, level how much does government owe independent power producers uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, today government will be owing quite close to $700 million uh, uh, to the combined independent power producers. $700 million U.S. dollars. Go for that. what period? Up to December 2020, or you've added, they, we are now almost in the, the, the first quarter of 2021. Because, Mr. Chairman, these debts are built on existing debt in terms of accumulation. And so it is difficult for us to separate uh, as to the proportion of debts that have been uh, set aside uh, by this new uh, regime. But I'm saying that at the time of 27, uh, uh, 2020, 2016, thereabouts, when we uh, took over till now, the beginning the debt was in the range of about 2.7. Uh, of course, new debts have been added, but now as we speak today, the debt level is about 1.5 billion uh, U.S. dollars, which between 600 to 700 million U.S. dollars being the debt. Chairman, that's appreciated. Yeah. Can you share what you know as outgoing Minister for Energy? What is it that GRA, Great Co, ECG owe to each other, respectively? Those in the chain, ECG, how much? Uh, to Great Co, how much? And to VRA, how much? to the best of your knowledge. I'll supply the interagency debt arrangement to this committee because there's still reconciliation ongoing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do you have an idea how much it is? Uh, if the IPP debt uh, add up to about 700 uh, million, uh, then the debt between the other uh, companies obviously will be in a range of about 800 million US dollars. So beyond termination of PDS, the Minister of Finance in the budget statement of 2020 had this emphatic statement to make. Moreover, government remains committed to the energy sector reforms. What other reforms have you undertaken as lead minister in that ministry? We have begun an aggressive process to come out with what we call the, uh, the cash water flow mechanism. The cash water flow mechanisms allows the various operators in the sector to have uh, liquidity uh, space. Uh, all the collections are put into the baskets, and from that basket, disbursements are being made based on the formula that we arrive on. Either to the money goes to ECG, and ECG have to use its own unilateral decisions, you know, to uh, make payment to the various IPPs. So we have introduced what we call the cash water, uh, water, uh, cash water for mechanism, which currently is operating. We have undertaken a very aggressive energy sector recovery program, uh, which, you know, span up to between five years. The rationale behind that program is to lower the legacy debts and brought them to zero. And you can see that consistently, as we begin to follow the energy sector recovery program, we are bringing the debt uh, down to a level uh, that the Chairman, the Honorable Muntaka referred you to you exercising 
oversight mandate in the absence of a board for the Mineral Development Fund. After the Minerals Income Investment Act was passed at 978, did you appreciate what the consequence of that will be on the Mineral Development Fund and for community and cheese benefiting from the Mineral Development Fund? Did you see any nexus of a relationship uh, I did not really uh, see uh, that relationship, but what I'm quite clear, aware of that, the rationale for the establishment of the New Development Fund is mostly to benefit the, the communities, so that the fund has a formula of direct allocation to the communities and also the affected areas that uh, exploration and mining activities have been uh, undertaken. In the briefing you have received so far, what's the status of the Ghana Burkina Faso railway line? Thank you. Uh, feasibility studies have been conducted. Uh, requests for proposal uh, have been sent. Three companies have been shortlisted. Uh, the Burkina Bees, as I speak today, Mr. Chairman, are ready to hit the ground uh, uh, running. Uh, and so we are now going to do evaluation on these three companies and uh, which of them might emerge as a winner, of course, we will uh, begin to take the process forward from there. So a lot of activities have been done on that major line. Earlier on, you responded to a question from the Honorable Patricia, I believe. Now, you are trying to explain the benefit of rail transport against investment in roads. You know that when we do the roads, particularly for purpose of bauxite and others, they deteriorate. So we need, you've traveled abroad extensively. There are people in New York who work in Washington because they have a reliable fast train line to join. There are people in New York who may be in other parts of the U.S. because of a reliable train line. Share your dream. What do you want the railway sector to look like in Ghana? Mr. Chairman, thank you. I want a railway sector where my people from Hohe can move from Hohe and come to uh, Accra and undertake their activities, those who want to work here, and then go back within a period uh, of uh, two hours. Uh, I want the railway sector where traffic density of our road will gradually migrate uh, onto the railway I want a railway sector that will give a credence or an advantage to lasting durations for our road. Currently, the traffic density of our roads, the lifespan of most of these roads, are three to four years. And we spend a lot of money on rehabilitation process of these roads. I want a railway sector that will migrate, you know, those uh, difficulties. A sector that will begin to have a multiplier effect on the growth of this country. That is how I see the railway sector. Uh, Thank you, Chairman. But you note that it's capital intensive. You can live the dream only if you have the money. Where would you find the resources to improve the railway regime of Ghana? Mr. Chairman, it's a question of priority. As a country, do we have to sit down and say we don't have the money? We wait for the money before we build the race. As a country, do we have to say, well, our debt-to-GDP ratio is quite high and we cannot go and burden this country with any additional debt on our balance sheet? We need to take the railway sector as a priority. And I think that that is the only way we can, we can go. So yes, of course, global funds, difficult, country has limited resources for the construction of the railway. But His Excellency Nana Rodan Kouakoufou mentioned it categorically about his interest. That gives me the justification that there will be some attention in that area. If you say that we can send some amount of attention to that area, then of course we will look for the money. The money can come in as a debt. My belief is that that debt will be paid off after the construction of the railway because of the impact it's going to bring into this economy. So we may have the debt, we may have the rising debt GDP ratio, where the impact of the construction of the railway will clear most of those debt in the near future. Now, we've passed the Public-Private uh, Act, Partnership Act. Do you share the view, for instance, that 
we should just go in, for instance, a one billion US dollar facility made from maybe from Japan or China or any other country with expertise in real development. Then make the mineral, then make the annual budget funding amount of uh, the, under the Petroleum Revenue Management Act a collateral. Then we know that we are investing one billion. This is how it will be serviced over a period of time. Then we can be certain that we have dedicated resources for railway development. Do you share that? Mr. Know? Chairman, that's a very brilliant idea. Uh, I will give it due consideration in the House, give me the note. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the Honorable Member for Ejisu, in requesting for Bonkra, naturally, if you want to develop the inland port, you must be looking at trade facilitation, the ease of doing business, the speed of doing business. Now, you see, uh, the western and eastern lines are to facilitate passenger and freight movement, including activation of the Bonkra inland port. Now, in your briefing, are you aware that a contract was signed in January 2020 EPC for the construction of a standard gate line from the Tapuradi port to Uni Valley? Has that been brought to your notice? Yes, that has been brought to my notice. Will you facilitate the movement of passengers and freight to Bankra as has started under the reconstruction of the Western Railway Line? Precisely so, Mr. Chairman. Why is it a standard gauge? The, the rationale for the standard gauge is the migration of the whole world from the narrow gauge. The standard gauge, as I stated earlier, has its own advantage. The speed, the axle load, and the stability in terms of its movement. And so Ghana as a country, the master plan is to migrate away from the, uh, the, the narrow gauge that we have to standard gauge. Only few countries currently still use the, the narrow gauge. In our sub-region, we have, for instance, only South Africa. And so when it comes to issue of spare parts, the difficulty to get there will be very difficult. And that may also be the underlying reason why the master plan suggests that we move to the standard gauge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, do I take it that Aflao Elubo Railway Line, Kotoku Hune Valley Railway Line, Metro Light and Transit Systems in Accra and Kumasi will not suffer under your hands as Minister responsible for railways? Mr. Chairman, we will do our best to make sure that the master plan is implemented from face to face. Chairman, I'm about ending for the Minister designate for railways. <laughs> In one of your responses to an earlier issue raised by a colleague, you were categorical in terms of different tariff regime for payment by consumers and by industry. I'm aware that the Association of Ghana Industry, AGI, have repeatedly made strong representations to you as minister to correct that wrong in order that in Ghana, we are not using power for purposes of generating growth and investment, but just, uh, as uh, Onabla, he said, we are just interested in those who use it for pressure, pressure, on and on. What will you do? You, you are leaving the ministry. The AGR is essentially disappointed in the government of Ghana for not leaving the talk on this particular matter. Have you recommended that to the new coming minister to draw a dichotomy between consumers, ordinary, who use it for their domestic purposes and those who need it for their industrial purposes. Thank you, Chair. Yes, Mr. Chairman, that uh, appeal, of course, was sent to me. Uh, we looked at it. But at the time, uh, as I stated earlier, some recovery programs will need to be completed within the sector. Currently, high losses, power thefts, uh, non-availability of meters. So the intention was to address some of these system deficiencies that we have. Obsolete equipment, which of course the President has given a directive replacing almost over hundred million dollar worth of obsolete equipment. It is our belief, my belief at that time, that after we have addressed these deficiencies in the system, then of course we will begin to migrate to a lower tariff regime for the industry. Mr. Chairman, I will recommend the same to the incoming minister and I know him very well. I'm sure he will take it up uh, for the benefit of the AGI. Chairman, I, I just know from the nominee, 
whether is compliant with his tax obligations and also compliant with his asset declaration requirements to hold the high office of minister. Thank you, Chair. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I'm done, but just a commentary that our oil resources are not infinite, to quote you. Indeed, I have a World Bank report here that I'm reviewing, and they are projecting that by 2050, uh, Ghana may have exploited largely this oil and gas that we have done. Having worked at the Ministry of Energy, do you see anything that needs to change with our petroleum revenue management regime? Do you see any need? And what are your recommendations? Thank you, Chair. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the, our replacement ratio, of course, is very low. Uh, production to reserve, it's low. And so additional reserves at each particular point in time is a key index for any emerging country like Ghana. The resources, it's not finite, as rightly said. And so what we need to change is to see how we can attract global funds to Ghana. Unfortunately for us, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, uh, global funds these days have been limited because of the growth in uh, uh, renewables. Some funding have their restriction, and if it is going to be a conventional resources like fossil fuel, the system will not allow that to grow. So the fear for the country is that if you are not careful, we may still have oil underground, but we will not be able to extract it. Mr. Chairman, you recollect when we leave the Stone Age, the stone didn't finish. There were a lot of stones at the time the world migrated from East Stone Age. That is why it becomes very important for a country like Ghana to begin to create more conducive physical regimes that can attract the uh, IOCs to come in and exploit the resources as quickly as possible. Resources beneath the ground had no value until we brought it out. So yes, I agree with you, things need to change. And one of the fundamental things that we need to change is our physical regime. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, just a comment. Sand Power was signed in 2010 and not 2016. In your exchange with the Honorable Muntaka, that came up very uh, strongly. The Sand Power Agreement from the records available to, available to me was signed in 2010 and not 2016. And having been Minister for Energy, there is a lot of talk, even in the budget statement that I can refer to here, excess capacity, excess capacity. You know apart from the fact that energy was critical to our development, investors need some assurance from government. What other assurance could you give as Minister for Energy in those circumstances, apart from excess uh, production of what you generated and what you probably needed? Because banks, banks, banks will take comfort in a government security and guarantee than an individual private sector person just telling them that I'm going to produce this megawatts of power for Ghana. Can you respond to that? Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chair, I'm not quite clo uh, clear with the question. If Honourable Member can please come out. No, I just want to get an explanation from you that when we get unnecessarily critical of excess capacity or excess generated power, we lose sight of the fact that you needed to be bankable. Those private sector players needed to be bankable and could only be given assurance by government, which government could only be to give guarantee that there is security for those uh, production. That probably, in my view, accounted for what is described largely as excess no-need energy capacity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman one, of, one of the problems that we've had over the past was procuring generation without competition. Most of the generators that we have today have undergone through negotiation. And so if you really want to send a clear signal to investors to have some interest in your power sector, I think the best way is to make the process for procuring uh, power uh, purchase agreement. And I, I would think that that is the way to go. Uh, investors may not necessarily be looking at a country as not being friendly in terms of the power sector uh, uh, system, but uh, any emerging country uh, in, in this sort of power generation have these experiences, you know, from one level uh, to another. So the assurance I want to give to investors, especially in, in the sector, is that our power demands is about 200 megawatts on an annual basis. So 
we should not just begin to procure power when we have not achieved that level of demand. Of course, demand will have to meet with supply. But as a country, are we saying that we wait for demand to grow before we bring in supply? Or we want to put in the supply and for demand to grow and meet? We have to decide. If we are going to put in the supply for demand to meet, of course, we must... Chairman, to Chairman, my, Chairman, my final comment. This weekend, I drove past Balogu to Nalergo Gambaga to Lembensi. The Palogu power project that was brought to parliament almost 800 to 900 million US dollars I did not see any sign of commencement of work what is the status of it thank you Mr. chairman that is true the contractor has written to our office for advanced mobilization they deployed their staff to the work to start some ground investigation in terms of the soil uh, uh, exercise which they are currently doing uh, the delay is as a result of uh, funding. Don't forget, this project is solely on the balance sheet of government. And as of when, I'm sure uh, Finance Minister released uh, the, the, the mobilization you know, that they requested. I will expect work to progress quickly as possible. And uh, Chairman, Minister, your advice, and this is my final, I keep to it, Chairman. Bagri, Bagri Dam, so spillage, spillage. The spillage of the Bagre Dam and its consequence on agriculture, on houses, on livelihood. As Minister for Energy, what do you think we can do right to save lives and to prevent the continuous yearly and seasonal spillage from Bagre? Best approach is to uh, cut channels running water for purpose of irrigation and that has its own cost uh, implication. Unfortunately, over the period, a lot of lives have been lost. But it's also on record the amount of work this government put in, uh, in terms of some uh, activities to constrain the, the spillage of the, the road. But in my own view, I think the only option and alternative that is available for government is to make sure that we capture, you know, uh, the water for uh, purpose of uh, irrigation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, Honorable Domini, thank you for attending upon the house. I have no question for you. Uh, you are discharged. You have had a long day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm most grateful to the Honorable House. Thank you. Honorable members, it's 6.30. We'll resume in 15 minutes. Uh, 15 minutes, quarter to 7.
Honourable members, let's resume, please.